Thanks everybody for joining. So um, my name is Sedki Abushamala. I am a solutions architect lead here at Tyke. Uh, we are a full lifecycle API management provider. And I'm coming uh, to you live today from London, Ontario. Although for those of you uh, up in the Montreal headquarters, I'm there quite a bit. Would love to catch up and grab a coffee. So reach out anytime. So today uh, I'd like to talk to you about GraphQL. It's a technology that I've been uh, a, spec uh, a skeptic of, excuse me, for a long time, but uh, have finally seen the light. So today uh, I'm going to talk to you about why we believe that the future is a graph. So before we start, let's talk about a few home truths about <clears throat> complex systems. So number one, a system's complexity will grow as the size of the organization grows, right? makes sense. And, it, and, and the way it grows is not linear. It, it, it grows at a scary, scary scale here. More people joining here. So number two, well-sized, smaller systems are easier to manage than massive monoliths, right? Some of you might be uh, hearing this, seeing this, and uh, knowing uh, which way I'm headed here. And then number three, the modern organization is not just the software that they build, but it's also the software that they use. And we'll talk about this in a second. So the reason I want to lay these out is because they reflect the reality that software is all around us. And that software is typically delivered as an API. It's not just to consumers like apps and sites, but as a full-blown architectural pattern. So by now, uh, you may know where I'm going with this. Microservices, that's right. Uh, to use a better term, uh, let's say well-sized services. And I don't want to get into a debate here about how big or small the domain of a service should be. Let's just agree that the underlying principle uh, that smaller well-defined units are easier to manage than large singular ones. So that's because uh, why are microservices important? And it, it doesn't just affect the developers themselves and the development teams that own a domain, no. Uh, the microservice architecture is actually most beneficial to the ops and software development lifecycle teams that need to coordinate releases and to manage the cost of scale. It's actually this layer above the develop build uh, layer itself where microservices really shine. So inevitably, breaking up a monolith does make sense for larger organizations. Wow. Of course, the other benefit is speed to market. Uh, making changes to a microservice is kind of like hot, hot swapping code, just a lot less cool. Um, so I just realized this is, uh, we haven't muted all participants. So welcome to those of you have, who have joined. Uh, please go ahead and uh, mute your mic. I will help there. Uh, and uh, let's treat this as an interactive demo. So if you have questions, pop them in the chat. I can see there's already a whole bunch of chats in here. Um, Boom. All right. I have my eye up on the, on the Zoom chat. If you have questions, you can drop them in. And Kaylee, who's uh, joining me uh, on the Tyke side, will, will help make sure that um, uh, I'm getting to your questions. Okay. So speed to market, we talked about that. So the thing is, what we're looking at, um, this is not the whole picture of an API first organization, right? We're looking at the, uh, the products, the API products that we build as a, a, as, a, as a company, but that's not all of it. So let's zoom out a little bit. And what do we get in these gray boxes? Um, let's talk about that. So I don't want to get into the history uh, about why microservices have become so dominant in the enterprise today. Uh, instead, I want to talk to you about these gray boxes, which... Um, which are the other services that have become part of your service ecosystem without you uh, really asking for it. Here's a stat that's gonna shed some light. So the average organization will have up to 137 different SaaS applications that they use to operate the business, 137. We're talking CRM, identity, uh, stock management, e-commerce, newsletters, HR, recruitment, advertising, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm sure there's thousands more that I haven't mentioned. So it's extremely likely that you as a company are constantly interacting with the APIs from these services. Uh, for example, let's uh, getting a notification in Slack when a contact form has been submitted or a seal has been completed. That's an API call under the hood. 
And that's just one example. So each of these 137, just use the average number, SaaS services that you buy, um, it's a key service and, and they should be offering an API that you can use to consume. And almost all of these SaaS providers do. So the question is, uh, the APIs exist, or let's presume that they do, um, but do you really use them? So let's talk about this problem a little bit more. So think about how much value is trapped inside the data silos that these applications all aggregate. So they store information from software interactions as well as human interactions. So, you know, take a CRM. There's inputs that are from your staff every day, all the time. And that data, but the real world can be categorized and filtered. And there's a whole lot of data. That's just one example of CRM. Let's, you know, scope out. We can see that it's, it's a fairly big problem. But this isn't a new problem. Uh, you know, back in the 90s, you'd go buy an Oracle database and host it yourself, or you'd buy SharePoint or WebSphere and run that along uh, on dedicated hardware. Um, and then came the cloud and uh, poof, you could migrate that out and save on hardware, but you're still dealing with this massive store of value. Uh, the only difference is between now and the 90s is instead of having this isolated silo, you now have these lovely APIs that you can interact with. And if you followed any trend, all of these older self-hosted licenses are kind of moving to a more profitable and agile pay-as-you-go solution that's sitting in infrastructure you don't need to maintain or patch, right? Serverless, in other words. And bidding more people. Um, <clears throat> and of course, you use them. We integrate with these silos all the time. It's one of the key drivers of the software industry. So how many people here have had to integrate with Stripe or you know, uh, PayPal or something else, Twilio? Um, but it's messy. Uh, maybe not for one team or one developer, but as you scale out, it gets really messy. So what we have is your typical picture is you're going to have a series of microservices that consume dependent external APIs, and these will be point to point integrations, right? So we have a billing uh, product, a content product that consumes a CRM. We have a render product that uh, goes to our, our support software that we, that we pay for, uh, transactional emails that are... Um, uh, tied into Stripe or, you know, whatever you're using for payment and so on. And so there's nothing wrong with this approach. It's necessary, it's, especially when looking at it uh, from an outside in perspective where the application stack consumes data and call functions from the dependencies. The one thing worth mentioning here is that the more of your services interact with the dependency, the more risk that you add. Right. So, for example, for our CRM software, we have billing and content that both consume it. That's additional risk. So, of course, we can get around some of this with uh, using solid principles, uh, for example, with a facade pattern. So that's better. Right now, we only need to update and maintain the facades if the vendor we're using decides to give us grief with an unannounced upgrade or a break and change. However, we did add two more services now. And those services still have multiple dependents. So a single failure of our facade now affects multiple interlock services. They're now entangled. Let's, let's complicate things even more with a real world example. It, it's a slightly different matter when you need to support, when you need uh, the, the support system, excuse me, to also speak to the CRM uh, software. So how does that even begin to work? Well, now we have this connector. So your brain might be hurting a little bit now, and it should, because this is how you get microservice bloat. And I'm not going to go into great detail here about service mesh. Uh, I'll, I'll just say that the service mesh will not save you here. It just makes this diagram we're looking at cleaner. Uh, but really under the hood of that service mesh, these are still point to point integrations with a mediator. So to get the CRM software to talk to the support system, we've had to do two things. We've had to build a new facade for the support uh, system because the number of dependencies has gone above one. And now we've also had to write a connector service to normalize data between the two systems, right? And we've seen this a lot. Historically, this is the pattern uh, of a company as it matures, or if, if that's the right word to use. And so now we've got this custom connector we built. And it might just be a Lambda function, but nonetheless, it's more stuff that we need to maintain. So to summarize, we needed to write multiple new microservices to properly abstract external dependencies in the form of, facade, uh, of a facade. And now should we wish to directly integrate two dependencies, we now need to write a mediator service for our facades. All of this is somewhat mediated by a service mesh, right? But now that also means we have to maintain a service mesh. And for anybody who's ever gotten close to that, it's really no small task. 
And finally, so my integrations are still point to point, right? If I wish to perform an integration with a dependency with another service, I need to integrate with the facade. And if the facade does not encompass the full functionality of the dependency, I need to modify that facade as well. Okay. <clears throat> so the last point is probably the biggest issue. Ideally, when writing software and especially microservices, you will want to keep the functional footprint and therefore risk as small as possible. So you will only ever build exactly what you need. And that's not a bad approach if you have the liberty of a homogenous, well-crafted uh, microservice. Um, but in reality, stacks are a lot more messy, right? And there's more traditional way to deal with this. And it's one some organizations find themselves in today. Uh, and one that in theory shouldn't require more code uh, and could potentially solve the facade functionality problem. And the solution is called throw more money at it. So what are we talking about? Well, what is this mess that we're looking at here today? In this scenario, an expensive consultant comes along and tells you that you need to install an ETL system to normalize and combine all of your data. Then you have to wire it into data warehousing platform that you can query with your business intelligence software. I'm assuming you have that too. And then to install an enterprise service bus because it can provide normalization connectors for the APIs of each of your dependencies for a price. And then modify all your microservices to account for the message-based development pattern needed to get all this working. So your reaction looking at this might be something uh, like this. All of a sudden, your complexity has tripled. You have new inputs, new outputs, and a new integration challenge that's meant to handle your existing integration challenge. So it's a lot. Now, this is an extreme example. I, I'll admit that. But of course, you don't need all of these things. You might only need one or two. Um, unfortunately, even just one or two of these solutions does add significant systems complexity. And so, you know, uh, we deserve better as a technical uh, uh, solutions um, uh, people. So let's ask ourselves what uh, I can do more with my, with the uh, microservices, right? But, and, and make it look manageable, but how? Why add more layers of software coordination to connect stuff when I can just write a microservice and do it myself, right? What is a modern microservice addicted organization meant to do with their 137 software applications that potentially enrich and store massive amounts of value and data like we talked about in the uh, in the CRM example. So before I scare you back to uh, DIY, do it yourself, the answer, I believe, is not lash everything together with intermediate microservices, as tempting as it may be to scratch that short-term itch. As we've demonstrated, it's still a great deal of work, and we still have the scope challenge to contend with to mitigate future integrations. It also means you need to build an API observance team to keep up with any and all dependent changes with the upstream. And that would suck, right? I mean, imagine having to maintain and manage someone else's API. Who in their right mind would ever want to do API management for a living? Anyway, let's look at a different paradigm. What if you could integrate your data as easily as a database table join? Right? What if you had a data integration layer and never had to change your upstream services? So what if when you needed to integrate your CRM platform with your accounts microservice, you didn't need to write a new layer or make a point to point integration? What if you, in other words, exchanged your message bus for an API bus? So here's, here's a, a real quote from um, one of our users. So if you are using microservices, um, you're very likely to, to be using an API gateway. And we'll, we'll talk about why that's important. So the quote, we're connecting a WooCommerce shop to SAP uh, by design. And I wanted to have a look at how tight data transformations work. So why not just handle this transformation in the API gateway layer? Um, well, you know, as much as we at Tyke would love for everybody to use a, a, API Gateway to do their integration, this is not the way. Because as soon as you do that, API, uh, your API Gateway becomes the new monolith. Why? Well, you likely need to pack a bunch of business logic into the gateway, and that's hitting complexity because the code and the logic is no longer directly part of your software cycle. Um, you may as, at that point, you may as well have written a bunch of intermediary services. And now you're very locked in on this vendor, which is supposed to be providing uh, a tool. 
So ultimately, you are also still dealing with the raw APIs of your SaaS providers. Uh, so you're still doing point-to-point -point integrations and baking vendor logic and potentially SDKs into your application layer. And heaven help if you're uh, doing complex transformations like this person. So let's talk about a better approach. And this is where, in our opinion, GraphQL really shines. So GraphQL is hot. A lot of you might have already heard of it, but uh, it, it's really hot for the wrong reasons, right? Most people think GraphQL today, it's a, it's a promote, it's a proponent. Um, it's proponents, excuse me, will argue that it increases speed to market of each API client application. Uh, for example, a React uh, single page app or a mobile app, et cetera. And to a point that is true until you dig a little deeper into that paradigm. The key issue with GraphQL as an externally focused interface is that it exposes you to a few risks. So number one, you can't easily predict the paths a query will take. Number two, you have to worry about deeply nested queries that could potentially cause a DOS attack, you know, inadvertently or maliciously. That's the, the, the M plus one attack. Number three, you need to worry about accidentally exposing data that you really didn't want to. And number four, securing GraphQL is still an open subject. You know, as a technology, it's still relatively new. Although, by the way, Tyke does a great job of it. <clears throat> so all of that, uh, let's go and meet some people. All of that freedom of getting what you want, you know, when you want, how you want, also means exposing all those options to do so to a client app. And here's the kicker. It's a single page app that you don't typically control. But let's take a step back here. And I said that GraphQL shines when considered in the internal API or integration context. Why is that? Well, GraphQL is a structured query language, if uh, you're not familiar with it, uh, that gives you what you want, you know, when you want, and how you want it. So if all of your internal services were GraphQL and you wrote resolvers for your 137 third-party SaaS APIs, then you could theoretically query any data in your stack with a single query um, and get a normalized response back. So this is not too dissimilar to our example earlier of writing intermediary services. So what I'm proposing is that GraphQL should really be considered as an extremely powerful integration language layer because it has all the hallmarks that we need. Uh, it normalizes data uh, for the request to JSON. Um, it's strongly typed and held by the GraphQL schema. And the mediation happens in the resolver. Furthermore, it provides a standard interface to interact with multiple services. Uh, provided the interfaces are also present in the graph. And so it normalizes your client code significantly. And then also it can handle, but doesn't rely on message queues and real-time event subscriptions, uh, which makes this an optional component. So you can still consider message-based uh, pipelines or uh, architecture and not have to be reliant on it as we've seen with the other uh, architectures that we just took a look at. And with good resolvers, it is possible to stitch data together between schemas and then therefore have a single graph for the entire service and uh, dependency stack. Okay, it feels like we're getting closer, right? Um, so theoretically, if you build your APIs graph first, then you can create an enterprise-wide data plane that can be queried by any developer for any imaginal integration requirement. So in the world of microservices, Lambda functions and service meshes and everything else, having a standardized interface to all of that data means mediating operations between applications suddenly becomes extremely easy, right? No more proprietary connectors, less concerns around compatibility and upgrades of those systems, no more reliance on a message bus and its associated architecture. A self-describing, uh, in GraphQL, what you get natively, a self-describing, discoverable, unified query language for all of your data, um, a, a new focus on function, not data, and then finally, of course, faster dependency consumption and so faster time to market. But really, this is APIs all the way down. And I know before the angry comments start flowing, uh, there are a couple of gotchas. And I did gloss over a few things, and, and there are some still uh, real problems to solve with this idea. So GraphQL, as it stands now, is only suitable if used in a greenfield context. So only new apps. Uh, so you can write your services GraphQL first, and then you don't have to worry about uh, writing middleware resolvers for your existing REST or gRPC service stack or whatever it is you're using. Uh, and ideally, only uh, really useful if your SaaS service providers themselves provide a GraphQL API. 
Otherwise, you need to write a resolver for them and maintain it. And now we're headed back to the same problem we had with the API gateway bus, which is a very bloated uh, vendor tool. And then last but not least, um, in the end, in order to perform some integrations, you still need to write new logic and services to handle complex edge cases. Um, so we're still adding new microservices. So maybe we haven't quite reached an API first integration heaven yet. So to round off, what is it that we've been talking about? So we at Tyke are spending a lot of time on this problem. You see, we're pretty convinced that APIs are the integration paradigm of the future and that GraphQL is a fertile ground to plant the seeds of a new way of thinking about service integration. You see, if you could achieve a GraphQL data layer to handle your integration and then plug in all of your external and internal data sources and then have a single query language on top of all of that uh, for your company's uh, data is, is a very powerful proposition. Uh, and so we've spent the last two years trying to make this a reality. We call this the universal data graph or UDG for short. And a lot of you are familiar with the technology or have seen it demoed. Uh, and so we've developed this engine that enables you to do exactly what I've just described here without having to write any new resolvers or any code at all. And uh, I'm going to show you exactly what that looks like. And we can take a look at that now. All right, what do we got here? Good, good. <clears throat> okay, so uh, uh, I'm not going to get into the details of what it is we're looking at. Some of you may be familiar with Tyke other, uh, or API management in general. Others will not. And so I'll, I'll kind of get to the meat of it. And so here we have a graph queue. We're here sitting in Tyke's API management layer. Um, and we're going to go into a, a UDG a graph that I've already pre-built and combined with, with a couple of REST sources. And then we're going to enrich it by adding a third. And for those of you that are joining a little bit late, feel free to dump your questions in the uh, Zoom chat and uh, we'll make sure we get to, to any of them. Okay, and so we have this example, which is JSON placeholder, and we can open this up um, and, and we can hit it. Uh, but more importantly, we can actually take a look at the open API spec that defines what that API is. And so social media rest is, is that API here on my developer portal. So, um, you know, to zoom out a little bit, let's pretend that we have a development team that's exposed this social media group of APIs. Whether it's a microservice or a monolith, I don't really care because the benefit of an API gateway is that it uh, hides all that uh, complexity away. All I care about is what are the endpoints, what's the data, and how do I integrate with them? And so I, as either a consumer of your APIs being a third-party integrator or another development team at Bell or whatever, um, can, can just go to the developer portal, view the APIs and start to, to build on top of them. And now we're kind of getting into the meat of API management as a program at the company. And so clicking into my API, we can now see all the various APIs and API endpoints that belong to this API product, which was, was we called it up here is the social media rest group of APIs. And so if I click on view documentation, I can view that there's users APIs, there's the to-dos, photos, albums, comments, and posts. So let's imagine that these APIs provide the data that's going to power a social media uh, product, such as Tykebook. So we have uh, uh, a landing page. My landing page is going to show my user information. So if I open up this user's endpoint, we can actually see here, we can get a specific user. I can try it out. I can dump the ID of a user in here and hit execute. And then I get back all the user uh, data that belongs to my user, which is the ID of one. So there's my name, my username, my email, and my phone, my website, and all that kind of stuff. And so my landing page is starting to get populated pretty well. Next up, I want to get all the posts that belong to my user. And so I go up here and I take a look at posts. And I can see that there's a different endpoint here, which will get all the, all the posts that are available. Uh, more so, I can filter by the user ID to get all the posts that belong to a user. And now we're getting closer to our landing page. So if I stick in the user ID over there and press execute, I get back all the posts that belong to that user. So we're two thirds of the way there. The last step is I want to get all the comments that belong to each post. Um, and that will give me my complete landing page. So I can see here, there's another comments API. I can open that up and I can make an API call. So here's get all the available comments more so I can filter by the post ID. Uh, and so I can dump my post ID in here and get all the comments that belong to each of those posts. So now we figured out where to get all the data for our landing page, right? Um, however, I've had to do a, 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 a 
a lot of work to get here. So number one, let's assume that this is where your company is at, at least. And this is actually a gold standard, believe it or not, is having a well-documented, well-formulated API. And so using this, I can at least figure out what are the different resources and figure out where to get my data from. But the complexity is still on me, the developer, to go and figure out what these relationships are. Not only that, now if I went and I built my landing page using this, there would be a minimum of 20, 30, 40 API calls based off of the number of um, comments and posts uh, that I had to make uh, iteratively. And so that's a lot of fetching. So that's the rest way of doing it. Well, how would we do it using UDG or everything that we talked about if we were to combine it as a single API call? So let's go back to our APIs here. I've already done that for you. I've, I've built some of them. So if we go under GraphQL posts here, this is a, a UDG that I've built in Tyke. And so if I go to the schema, we can see that I have a user post here, uh, excuse me, a user type here and a post type here. And so what I did is I took a one-to-one -one mapping of the JSON and then, and then wrote it the schema in order to tell Tyke what the data structure looks like. And then the rest is history. And you'll see what this looks like in a second. So if I go to the to the playground, here's what's going to allow me to do a, a GraphQL query. And if you haven't seen this before, a GraphQL playground is very similar to let's say Postman for REST. It's a it's a UI that will allow you to write um, queries in order to get and update data. Um, and so you can see it actually comes complete with auto ID, uh, auto complete, and everything. So now I'm getting uh, the user query where the ID is one, and it, it can even tell me what all the different fields are. So another good um, feature of GraphQL is it actually lets you directly ask for only the fields that you want and nothing more and you get that back. Okay, great. So now uh, we've got the user data where the ID is one and I got the name and the email of my user. And so let's say I want the, the ID as well. I didn't have that. Uh, so that's good. So now let's say I want posts. Well, if we were to do posts using the rest way, the old way, I would have to go and make a second API call. But now because some some person who's used this no code approach or low code approach in order to stick together data services has already made this relationship for me. So using autocomplete, I can go in here and I can see that there's already a post field that is a sub resource of user. So if I open this up, and uh, I can ask for some data back, such as the ID and the title and the body. And now if I hit enter, we've made a single API call and I got back all the posts that belong to this user. Um, I didn't have to do any of the injecting. I didn't have to do any of the, uh, uh, the, the, the stitching myself. Tyke automatically did that for me. It knows that this, uh, the, an API request has uh, come in where uh, the user has asked for all the posts that belong to this user. Pretty powerful. So let's take it a step further, um, or not a step further, let's enrich it so we can see that this isn't vaporware and there's actually something going on here. So now we're gonna go ahead and add comments to posts. And what that's gonna let me do is uh, get all the comments that belong to each post uh, using a single API call. And so uh, let's go up a layer. I'm gonna take a look at my uh, REST API that's already managed here in Tyke. And if I open this up, I can of course go to the developer portal um, or I can just go directly to the uh, to the comments endpoint where the post ID is equal to one. And so for example, I just hit the endpoint for comments where the post ID is one, it returned back an array of comments. Each comment has a post ID and ID name, email, and body. And so now we can map those. So if I go back to Tyke, let's go back to our uh, UDG example here under schema, and I'm going to create a new type here, which is comment. And I'll just grab the, uh, let's say name and body for now. So name is a string and body is a string as well. So now we have a new type here. Next, I want to inject it as a post, uh, as a subtype of post. And so what I want to do here is I'm going to come into post. I'm going to create a new field that doesn't already exist on that resource, of course. I'm going to call it comments. And that's going to be an array of type comment. And then we'll switch to data sources. And so now here's where I tell Tyke where to get that data. And so if somebody asks for a post type and then requests for comments that belong to post, I'm going to now define the data source to tell Tyke where to get that data from. And so for the data source, you can see that I can select Tyke REST, Tyke GraphQL, or even external services if they're not managed by our company. But for now, I'll just select Tyke REST. It gives me a dropdown. I can select uh, from all the different APIs that I'm already managing in my ecosystem. And um, you can even see it gives me autocomplete and it will help me uh, by telling me what the different uh, things are here, different endpoints. 
So uh, we're going to go ahead and say post ID. And now using um, the curly brace, I'm going to inject data from a, the parent object. And you can see it actually helps me. Do I want to inject the ID of the type post, the title, the body comments? I want the ID, of course, to get that same API call. We'll give this a name. We'll call this the comments endpoint. And then we'll update and we'll, um, we'll save an update rather. And so now if I go under posts and I, you can see that there's a new field that's available here that's comments and I can ask for that for the name and the body. And if I fire that off, you can see type is getting all that data back. And then there we go. Using a single API call, I was able to get back all of the data from my landing page that otherwise would have been 40 or 50 uh, REST requests. It still is 40 or 50 uh, 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 REST API calls, but now instead of the developer having to worry about this, it's just done automatically. And that stitching is done at the uh, API gateway layer. So we're getting uh, close to the end here. The last thing I'll show you before I before I wrap it up um, and, and feel free to dump your uh, questions in the chat if you have any, is the portal. And so now, of course, one of the main drivers here is as I build out this GraphQL API, I can also publish it on my developer portal. And what that means if a developer goes to the portal and clicks on view documentation, they're actually going to get a full GraphQL sandbox in here that they can use with autocomplete. Um, again, going back to GraphQL, it's, it's, uh, it's self-documenting. Um, it's strongly typed. So if I ask for ID, you can see it, it, it breaks, it tells you that's not an object. If I want post, it, it helps me out with all of that. And so it becomes really easy to figure out how to use the APIs. And of course, like we say, self-documenting if you're not familiar with, uh, with GraphQL as a technology. Okay. So where were we? Um, right. So in summary, <clears throat> Modern uh, enterprises that are trying to liberate their data silos with their microservice stack should take a closer look at GraphQL as an equalizer. I firmly believe that there's a significant future ahead for GraphQL, not as a consumer facing API paradigm, but one that offers incredible opportunity for a discoverable, easy to use, highly visible integration platform. That, uh, but more importantly, it's in it's it's extremely compatible with the API first reality that we find ourselves in today. So that's it for me. Yeah, thank you so much for listening. I hope this talk was uh, useful and I look forward to uh, to speaking with uh, with with all of you, uh, hopefully about the subject. My email is uh, sedkey uh, at tyke.io. I'll just flip back here to the first slide. Um, Sedki at tyke.io. Um, yeah, looking forward to receiving your, your questions and hopefully talk more about the subject. So I'll stick around for a couple minutes. Uh, it, looks, it looks like there are some questions that I missed. Um, so the first question from Charles, that's a great question. So are there some kind of caching options? Uh, if you don't want to make those 40 requests in the background every time, let's say, um, absolutely. So one of the main benefits of be, being able to uh, stitch uh, uh, a REST API that's already managed by Tyke is that you can take advantage of all of your typical uh, API management uh, features. So just to flip back to the demo for a second. So uh, here we have our API that's managed in Tyke, right? This, excuse me, represents the users, comments, and posts API. Well, what we can do is we can go in here and we can add uh, plugins such as caching. We can do transformations and everything else that we want to apply it at this layer and then this happens outside of the uh, API uh, stitching layer or the UDG layer. So that's one of the amazing things about the technology is that uh, really it's, it's just an integration solution. But the most important thing is what's powering it is these APIs that are already managed that are taking advantage of not only you know, caching that you would see at the browser layer, but also you can inject and in, in, um, in, I guess, superpower your API by using typical API management uh, features that you would expect. Uh, Lay asks, uh, what if we need to pass some auth token to some request? Well, uh, you know, very, very common use case. Uh, so if we take a look at the schema under data sources, I used all open APIs, but let's, what if one of these underlying services were authenticated? What if we had to inject some token of some kind? Well, 
what we support today is uh, you can statically inject a token, right? So for example, if you're integrating with Stripe, you, uh, Stripe will give you an API key. And so you would come in here and you would tell Tyke for this data source, which is a comments endpoint, always inject this key statically. And it would be X API key. And then the value be one, two, three. And then Tyke, as it makes this API call to this service to get this data, it's going to inject this key. We do see some requests uh, for uh, for OAuth 2 um, in between uh, UDG and then underlying or uh, uh, upstreams, I should say. So that functionality isn't quite built yet. I'd be really, really curious to hear from you, Lei. Um, I apologize if I'm not saying your name correctly. I'd be really, really curious to hear from you if uh, what it is that you're looking for is is the static authentication enough, or would you need to uh, would you need to go a step further? Yeah, thank you. And Daniel, I'm glad you discovered Tyke today. Uh, I'm glad you uh, you liked it. Uh, another question came in from Rohit. Is the caching available for both the queries and the HTT responses with Tyke? Yes, we can inject caching at both layers. Yes. Uh, for the OA2 uh, here in IoT at Bell, yeah. uh, we're using it extensively. So yeah, it would be needed. Oh, okay. So you're using uh, system to system OAuth 2. I'm assuming that's client credentials. Uh, yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay. All right. So uh, would you would you expect that um, OAuth 2 authentication to happen automatically? And so, for example, if a token is expired, uh, Tyke would take care of the refresh and all of that. Uh, I guess that would be nice. Uh, I'm still exploring it as you're like talking about it right now. But yeah, it's for you know the clients usually do a request to our SSO, mm -hmm. and then and then uh, use this token that's I think five minutes expiry on it. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah, it's a it's a bit of a different use case because if you're if it's a consumer as in a person that's using an app that's being powered by UDG, the question becomes how do I get this person's access token or whatever it is. Uh, into the flow versus what you're describing, which is system to system, which is between UDG and my other upstream services is we're using OAuth 2 to protect our APIs. And so how can I get tied to dynamically uh, authenticate between them? So it's a very different uh, problem set. We are exploring both. Uh, and uh, yeah, what we have today is not much in, in the way of OAuth. So I'm really glad to hear that feedback. Thank you. Um, yeah. GraphQL or UDG, as I say, is only about uh, eight months old since we've released it, and it's uh, it's it's growing a lot. So, uh, very good feedback. Thank you. Great. Uh, what are options for self-learning training on Tyke? So, um, you know, the usuals uh, is our YouTube's. We have plenty of uh, information about GraphQL um, and UDG. So, you know, we'll we'll show you how you can take REST put it to GraphQL and then go the other way is I have GraphQL on the back end, how do I put REST on it? And then everything in between. So if you're uh, the kind of watcher who wants to learn with uh, YouTube, then we have plenty of those documentation. But if you have other, uh, if, you, if you're like me and you like to learn by reading um, and uh, we, you know, we have blogs and we have documentation, all sorts of stuff. So tyke.io uh, slash docs, uh, or just go tyke.io and then press on the documentation. You'll get taken to our uh, documentation page and it's got lots and lots of stuff. Kaylee, um, you know, feel free to interject. Let me know if we have, you know, any kind of articles that we can share with uh, the Bell teams here and uh, hopefully get them closer closer to getting started. Uh, there, uh, Kaylee says we can send out some resources. And there you have it. Okay, I think that's it for the questions. Mm -hmm. All right, anything else uh, from anybody? Going once, going twice? Mm, nope, I see. Yeah, you're welcome. I'm really, really glad uh, you folks are enjoying the, uh, the, the talk. Okay, take care, everybody. We'll, we'll talk to you all very soon. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Andy. Yeah, thank you.